You're listening to Sarah Hagen backstage with interviews and insights from years inside the music industry. Join Sarah as she talks with masters of their crafts, finding out what makes them tick both inside and outside of the music business. Welcome to Sarah Hagen backstage. My guest today, Brandon Steinekert, is known for having created and played with the band The Used and also for playing in Rancid for over the last decade. More importantly, Brandon is an amazing human being with a really beautiful outlook on life and on living it to the fullest. Please join me as I catch up with my good friend, Brandon Steinekert. Brandon Steinekert, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. It's so great to see you. It's great to see you too. It's been so long. It has been quite a while. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. But this is really nice. It's nice to catch up with friends here and um, get to see your your new space behind you too. Yeah. Yeah. Get a little FaceTime. I love it. It's great. Yeah. It's it's fantastic. So let's, um, let's hear how have you been? I know this past year has been crazy for all of us in this industry, of course, but right. um, how, how have you been through all of it? You know, I, I think the best way to put it is enduring, you know, like it's like kind of just making the best of it when everything is unknown, everything is chaotic, everything when we'll get to go to work again is an unknown when, you know, so I think it's, it's really been a test of, um, of mental health, I think for all of us. Right. And, and mm-hmm. so, you know, as, as much as it's pointed out weaknesses, it's also created new strengths and, and something that all you can do is kind of roll with the punches and, and kind of it puts things in perspective, you know, that it's like, like, I mean, I use work lightly, but like mm-hmm. work can't be everything, you know, and, and, and it really kind of, I don't know, I, I feel like perspective has been huge this last year. Where yeah. you have to take inventory on what's important and what really matters and, and you know, and kind of get in tune with yourself too, you know. Absolutely. I don't think a lot of us have spent this much time by ourselves or with ourselves or right. contemplating, you know, our, our health and in, in all of these um, ways, you know, physical health, mental health, um, relationships, you know, with friends and family and all of those things. I think it's, yeah. it has been a time of endurance. For sure. That's like the perfect word to describe it, I think. Yeah. And it's like a lot of true colors have been shown, you know, by by people close and, and far. And, and mm-hmm. it's like, again, I think it's a time to really, I don't know, I think, I think it's easy to put judgment on others, but I think it's an important time to look inward. And mm-hmm. uh, um, like I said, kind of take inventory of ourselves and and where we're at with things and what what our headspace is like. And when we think we're invincible or we think we're fragile, I think this last year has tested both. Where those of us that feel fragile, maybe we're not. Maybe we can handle a lot more than we give ourselves credit for. And those of us that feel invincible, maybe we're not. And we're all just kind of delicate. And I can, I, really, it leveled the playing field. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> just goes to show we're all human and in we all just need to survive and look out for each other, you know? That is the truth. Absolutely. And, you know, you, you, at the start of the pandemic last year, I remember you doing something that was incredible, which was putting together the PPE kits for the first responders in your area. And I just have to, I have to call attention to that because that was, that was amazing of you. I I mean, thank you. Yeah, for sure. You were sewing masks and, you know, putting the kits together and delivering them. And I remember that was a that was a time where things were really pretty scary, you know. Yeah. It really was. And, and to me, it was kind of a way to take that anxiety I was feeling and direct it towards something. I remember being out in town and and I passed this retirement center um, and there was this woman standing outside the window, like holding a phone, FaceTiming with someone through the window. Mm-hmm. And it was so sad and so okay. scary and so like, and at the time I live in a small town, it's a very small community. And so when this all very first started, no one had access to just the basics, the, the PPE, the masks were not available. Sanitizer right. was not available. Nitro gloves were not available. Um, so it was just 
as much as it was scary, it felt like kind of a call to action, like, all right, what can we do? And so, um, yeah, Danielle and I just started making homemade masks that we were going to just take to these, like, you know, there were these mom and pop restaurants trying to stay open, but they didn't mm -hmm. have things that were required for their employees to stay open and all this stuff. And so um, we started just making them. And that's when a, a local Salt Lake business reached out, like a first aid company, and they had access to a lot of these things. And we're like, hey, can we get some down to you and we'll donate them? And, you know, mm -hmm. so like, all right, now what's the best way to get them to all these people? Where can we find them if you need them? So that was when we just simply looked up like where to get, you know, these essential items. And it was like, if you're in need of these things, go to your local police and fire departments. If you have some to donate, go to your local police and fire departments. Mm -hmm. Exactly that. We just took boxes and boxes to both. I'm like, all right, get these to who needs them, you know, because there's so it's like, where do you even begin? You know, running around making deliveries. It was like, right. It was it, at the time it was all we could think to do. You know, we just had to do something, you know, and couldn't just sit back. And and when I had the opportunity, this team, this um, first aid kit company offering to help, it was like, all right, we have to we have to jump on this, you know. Yeah, I, I love that you took, you know, your you know, what you were feeling and saw an opportunity and just put some action behind it. It was, yeah. it was so great to see. And just I mean, that. I gotta be honest, it was partially selfish in the way that it was like a way to work through my own anxiety. So mm -hmm. could, like, all right, if like, this is scary, this is unknown, there's so many factors to all of this, like what can anyone do? Really? It felt so helpless. And it was just my own way of feeling like, I could find something to help, even if it was just a little tiny thing, you know? But right. it was, so it was like, this is great for me. This will be great for other people. This will be just great. I hope for, and hopefully it helped a lot of people. I don't know, but you know, I, I, I really hope that that helped keep businesses and, and things going and people able to visit and do whatever they could do, you know? Absolutely. I'm sure it made a big difference. You know, that's, that's <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, you know, you talk about the the whole anxiety thing. I think when the pandemic first started, um, even though we thought it was short term or, or shorter term than it was, mm -hmm. it was harder at the beginning, I think, than than it was toward the what we're hoping is the end of this. Yeah. Because it was trying to get used to this whole new lifestyle and this whole change and the, the family and friends, the worry about everyone's health. Um, so I, I remember those early days and kind of the the lifestyle change that went with it and the anxiety that went with it. And I think yeah. a lot of us felt more worried and anxious than maybe we ever had. So right. I like that, you know, you found a way to put it to good use and... Um, and you've been busy, you know, even though the touring that life hasn't been happening like it normally has, you have been busy. And I, I love to see, you know, your posts and everything that you do on social media, um, building a new house and yeah, yeah. Um, and all and you doing a lot of it. I mean, I saw <laughs> yeah. you like digging and so you have been putting your, um, you know, your energy into positivity. Absolutely. Again, it was kind of one of those, it was almost a survival thing, you know, where, mm -hmm. like you said, in the beginning, all this anxiety and all of this stuff, it was like, I think a lot of the times when many of us are dealing with anxiety and, and mental health issues and whatever, they stem inward where they come from a place of insecurity or, or history or whatever trauma, whatever it may be. And so that's one thing that we all learn to navigate those streams, you know, and, and figure out our way to get through it and survive and feel um, like we can, I don't know, adapt and, and get through everything. Okay. But this was a really unique situation because it was this outward thing that was really like became this unknown factor of just so many unknowns and we didn't know what was going on. We didn't know, no one had any answers. So I think that created a different kind of anxiety than most of us are used to. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So for me, it was like, again, just trying to stay proactive, trying to stay busy. It's like, all right, my music, there's nothing I can do. I felt like I was out on an island in the way that I just moved to this very small town in Southern Utah. Um, don't know anybody out here. I didn't intend to move out here. Mm -hmm. um, I had sold my house where I've lived for the last 15 years and, and, um, 
with intention to rebuild it, but then it w I couldn't because everything going on. And so then all of a sudden the house I was in was having like major issues. It was a newer home that we'd just been built very badly. So it was like mm -hmm. leaking with every rainstorm, just flooding into the house and oh, no. old and just this, like, I was like losing my mind. Like we're in a pandemic. I'm stuck in this house full of mildew and mold out in the middle of nowhere. I don't know anybody out here. It was just like losing my mind. So it was like, all right, I'm going to get rid of this house and rebuild like just down the street. And I was in a fortunate situation where because I wasn't touring or anything, I was able to be very hands-on with that build. So it was a lot of work, but I literally spent the majority of 2020 building a house like here every day, working with subs, just trying to do whatever I could do. Cause I don't, I'm not a construction worker. I don't have any, you know, specialty crafts and traits in, in that field, but I've learned a lot. I've, you know, um, mm -hmm. some stuff from the past, but, um, but yeah, it was really fun. Like everything from, working with the guys pouring concrete to like every, like every aspect of it, just being here every day, all day and learning how to drive tractors and things I've never done. <laughs> I'm planting palm trees and doing things, like things I've never done at all in my life, but it was actually tons of fun. I love that. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the fun things that you added to your house um, in a bit, because, you know, that kind of goes along with another theme that um, is a big part of your life, but I do want to talk about music and drumming and, yeah. and all of that. And, you know, obviously this past year has been lacking in so many of those areas for all of us. Um, but, but way back, let's talk about how you got your start playing and, mm -hmm. um, and you started drums were your first instrument, right? Right. Yeah. And it was like a very, my, my like approach to drumming was not it didn't come from a place of passion to playing music honestly i was mm -hmm. older than a lot of people i think i was around 15 maybe close to 16 when i started and um it all stemmed from i found this photo photograph of my father um when he was like 15 16 sitting behind a drum set and I'd always heard these stories about what this, like, what an awesome drummer he was, and that he'd like play Wipeout for his whole school and all that <laughs> stuff. And like, and, but I never saw that side of him, you know. Um, right. He didn't have a drum set, or I never saw him pick up drumsticks in in his lifetime. And he passed away. Um, he died of suicide when I was 11 years old. So it was kind of these like rough years, um, dark years for me. Mm -hmm. um, with my mom remarrying and a lot of abuse in our house with my stepfather and her. And, and so finding this photograph of my dad just kind of was like, gave me this like inspiration to do something to take after him. Mm -hmm. that up until then, the closest thing I was doing to take after him was just these terrible suicidal thoughts and stuff. And unfortunately kind of a, you know, you learn from your parents, you know, and, right. and like, I kind of learned early on that if things get too hard, there's always a way out and a very untrue message that I was learned, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, that was really like, it was more of a psychological um, and coping and, and this kind of mechanism in that way. That is why I started drumming. You right. Know? And then the passion for music came after that, you know, which was kind of weird. I don't know if that's how most people do it, you know, but yeah. <laughs> Different. I mean, I, I, you've told me that story before and like as, as sad and, you know, heartbreaking as it is, it, it is amazing that you found a way to connect with him in a positive way. So, yeah. you know, yeah. it's also beautiful in that aspect that, you know, that's the way that you, you ended up connecting with him and that, you know, you've talked before about how music has really helped your mental health and kind of like saved you in so many ways. And mm -hmm that's, that's a beautiful part of it too. It was really a transformation, like a very physical, mental, everything transformed in me because again, like, like skateboarding was my life. That was all I cared about when I was a teenager was just my few friends and skateboarding living in this small town in conservative Utah. Mm -hmm. It was not an accepted thing. We were getting chased by cops. We were getting chased by like jocks and whatever. And it was like, the rich kids making fun of us. And, and it was just like my whole life was this kind of subculture of skaters and our little group. 
Um, and I was just so angry all the time. I was never, I never um, directed it toward anybody else. I never got into like actual fist fights. You know, I, I would avoid that kind of stuff. I've always been a pacifist in that way, but um, I was just so angry and things were so dark, you know, my family was very poor and, and um, yeah, it was interesting because literally like there was a small time that as I got into drumming and stuff, I feel like I had that like kind of angry cross space all the time. Mm -hmm. And it was like playing drums and I would just, I was really terrible at it. I couldn't get the most basic coordinations down. It was a long learning curve for me, but when I did start to get it and I started jamming with other musicians and actually writing music and getting this like natural high from that, mm -hmm. um, it was incredible the change it had on me where it was just like this weight lifted. Like I carried myself differently. I was smiling. I was laughing. I was not angry. I wasn't punching walls and lockers anymore, you know? And, mm -hmm. and it just gave me this thing that when things were dark and I was feeling down, you know, and girls didn't like me. I, we only had a couple of friends get picked on all this stuff and come home to screaming and, and violence in the house. It was just like, I could just hit those drums and, scream and cry playing drums and all of a sudden feel better uh, mm. uh, demons were gone you know and so i i really thank drums and drumming for i mean i i truly would not be alive today if it wasn't for them so it's a, it's amazing i mean um you know you talk about listening to the music back then that was influential to you and playing and having that like therapy um, through music and through the drums. And then, and part of that was, you know, Rancid was a big part of that for you. Right. Um, and so it just, it, it's amazing to me now, you know, that you're drumming for Rancid and you have been for years and then, you know, it just kind of has come full circle. Yeah. It's been a, a really wild ride. That's for sure. You know, and, and the thing that really, when I was discovering music and stuff through skateboarding, through skate videos, through all the stuff, again, living in this small town, it wasn't like we had all these shows and I was just a young kid, you know? And so um, the more I found music, it was like this angst filled aggressive music was what was resonating with me. Cause it was like these people I could relate to and mm -hmm. content. And that was where punk rock became such a big part of my life was these were people cut from the same cloth as me um, and, and like-minded and, and everything else too. I love just like rock. I love like, you know, some of my first, the music that really made an impression on me very first was like, I mean, this dates me a, a bit, I think, but it, just like Nirvana, nevermind. I remember hearing that in like junior high and yeah. just the screaming. And I was like, what is this? Like, it was just unlike anything for me in my little bubble that I'd never heard anything, you know? And, and then, um, when the self-titled rage against the machine record came out, that just like, I feel like that album changed my life, you know, right. and, like to hear, like, I don't know, it just opened up so many doors creatively and mentally, like just with my outlook and my everything. So yeah. I understand I mean, that. Me. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I understand that 100%. I feel like the that time period in music before there were there wasn't that outlet, you know, music wasn't an expression of rage, really, you right. you know, in, in um, a lot of cases. Um, and I think when that music came out, I feel the same way, um, kind of like, touched by that style of music, even, you know, even just before I understood what it was about, just yeah. the, you know, the heaviness of it, there was something that was different and yeah. new and like, okay, this can exist. Like this style of music can exist. And, well, um, and then obviously like for me, it was a matter of it. Uh, like I represented like the small town kids, you know, mm -hmm. where was, like the exposure wasn't there to these like underground hardcore scenes and all this, incredible music that did exist, but yeah. didn't in my world at all. Cause I wasn't in a circle that knew of this stuff. Right. So it was like, how am I going to find something that I don't know what I'm looking for, you know? And, 
And so this exposure to hardcore, to all this stuff that, that, and just these incredible punk bands that had been doing incredible things that I had no clue about because I lived in a conservative household in a small town. And the only music I ever heard was beach boys and Kenny Rogers. You know? <laughs> So yeah. like, there's anything wrong with them love them both but, <laughs> but that, yeah that's exactly what i mean i think it i think it, you know it goes with what you're exposed to and yeah. the same thing with me like that this you know rage and nirvana and um you know the punk music that i was exposed to that opened up you know more mainstream music opened up avenues to the more underground stuff too right. and then i was right. like ironic, oh my god you know, like isn't it it's it's ironic that the exposure to some mainstream music actually helped us find underground music. Right. You can't always hate on that mainstream stuff because it might reach the right people that want to find all this underground stuff too. And, and yeah. more, more roots, I should say, than even underground. It's like, what are the roots of this stuff? These incredible bands had such great roots in these incredible other bands. And, and so it's nice when you can kind of get in touch with them. And it, that was a, a funny part of joining Rancid is it was it, like the punk rock I loved and grew grew up on mm -hmm. and like was playing along to and, and loving was like albums that had come out during the time I had found them. Mm -hmm. I didn't really date back. I was just still finding all the current stuff. And so um, even when I joined Rancid, it's been 14 plus years now. Um, when I joined the band, it was, it, it was great because they were – really exposing me to a lot of bands that were their influences. And it Absolutely. was rad to take that step further where it was like, well, what do you do when you're in the band? Who's one of your biggest influences? You know, you got to start drawing from the same influences of theirs. Cause I can't just be influ influenced by old rancid records. I've got to, you know, right. like, it's, uh, it was kind of an interesting situation to land myself in. I, I agree with that. And you know, it's, it's interesting to me, even when you hear some music that, like Nirvana and not knowing that um, some of that music was influenced by completely different styles and then being exposed to that. I recently heard Dave Grohl talking about how that, you know, Nirvana, his, his drum parts in Nirvana were influenced by the Gap Band, um, which to me, I was just like, oh, that makes so much sense. Yeah. But I would have had no idea. Like I wouldn't have yeah. made that correlation in the past. So I think it works in like a whole other direction too to expose um, expose you to different styles of music right. once you know what their influence was. Yeah. And um, and that's pretty cool too. Um, I mean, we gotta like, it, like there's definitely some respect that has to always be taken into account where for a band to be screaming, for, for Smells Like Teen Spirit, that, a denial part at the end, just screaming over and over. It's like there was nothing like that that had ever been played on the radio. Right. You know? It was yes. like to get away with that kind of intensity and, and, and abrasiveness, you know, and pull it off on television, radio, it yes. changed the game. And then, and then around the same time, I mean, I'm a huge Nine Snails fan, you know, and mm -hmm. Trent Reznor was just like constantly raising the bar. I mean, when you look at, the lyrics of closer and, and yes. <laughs> that chorus, it's like, how did you get away with that? And yes. that was, how did that happen? <laughs> song, like, that's incredible. You know, yeah. and, and rage against the machine killing in the name. It's like, wow. Like talk about like some real shit that needs to be talked about and people need to have their eyes open to and the fuck you, I won't do what you tell me mm -hmm. like as a like otherwise hit song. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Like, thank you to all those bands for, doing something that kind of took away people's hesitations or whatever. I think it allowed for people to get in touch with themselves a little more right? in a, in a way that there might be some, it was a little bit sheltered up until then, you know, absolutely and we needed to be dis disrupted. Yes. Yeah. We needed to be yelling and screaming along with those, um, CDs back in the day or right. cassette tapes, uh, you know, dating myself now, I definitely had nine inch nails, cassette tapes. And yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, yeah. so, you know, like, yeah, I mean, our parents, you know, I, I remember like, I remember my mom being like, what is happening right now? You know, Sarah's 
yelling along with with some nine inch nails and some rage but um <laughs> but like you know that it needed to happen that was yeah. it's an outlet you know um, it still does you know to me it was about what made that special is that it was dangerous mm. you know mm -hmm. it was something that was upsetting to some but right without being the intention was, I don't know, it was upsetting in the right way. If there's, if there's such a thing, I believe there is. Um, it was like a do no harm yet uh, shake things up kind of thing. And yes, I think I, even now we need that. I think right now, I think music could use that even more. I think it started to get a little safe well, and I think things it, up. or to yeah. be a little dis, you know, we need to, upset things a bit. Yeah, we need another disruption, a musical Agreed. disruption, right? But yeah. And I think that like art in itself, a lot of art when it's new, like a new style, it's disruptive or it's upsetting to some because sometimes it's cutting edge and you know people don't understand it. And um, so anything that's creative like that, that kind of pushes the envelope and pushes people outside of their box and their comfort zone, right. um, you know, it can, it can just, it can be disruptive in that way. But I agree with you. We need that. We need, we need it to continue um, for, for things to evolve. Right. Yeah. And that was a pretty big evolution in music. Absolutely. I, I, I believe things need to be broken to be repaired sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, well, no, that was a dumb way to put it. <laughs> things need to be broken to be improved. Is what improved. I um, right. I think like, um, there was an awesome, this is a really random thing. Um, I wish I could remember all the details. A friend of mine just showed me this like old style of like pottery and things that they would take broken pottery and repair it with gold. And okay. it actually made it far more beautiful and far more valuable. And it was just these destroyed pieces of art that were then repaired to be far more beautiful and far more valuable. And it was just kind of a nice analogy while I'm loosely remembering it even mm -hmm. um, that it's like sometimes, you know, breaking things is the way to improve things. You know, I mean, look at our own bodies. I mean, if you break your bone, mm -hmm. when that heals, that bone is now stronger than it was before you broke it. You know, right. I, I think there's a lot to learn from those kind of things, you know? Yeah. It's interesting that you just made a body analogy because I was thinking of muscles, how you like tear a muscle in order to repair it and like make it right. bigger and stronger. So Literally, yeah. um, the only way to strengthen it is to tear it, you know, is to destroy yeah, it. You know? Absolutely. Um, I think we've got a song in there somewhere, Brandon. Right? <laughs> 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 but, um, so, you know, we kind of jumped to Rancid, but let's talk about the used a little bit because you you had such success, you know, creating the used and becoming, you know, a, a platinum selling band. And it's just, it's so amazing to me. I remember um, you telling some stories about how it was just such a change in your life going from where you were at to being in this like incredibly successful band that people just really loved it was a, a one of the many whirlwinds i've had in my life for sure i mean at the time utah state had never had a signed band like um to a major our biggest um there was a band iceburn back in the day that signed to revelation records that was a utah band but otherwise donnie and marie osmond were like the biggest you know it was like <laughs> We didn't have like a rock band that yeah. ever came from Utah State ever. And so it was really special and, and a really um, exciting thing for us to be the first in our state's history. But it was also really intimidating and scary because all we knew was this like, in, like you heard a lot of bad at the time. This was like very early 2000s. So coming out of the 90s where all the talk of major labels and all this stuff was just these horror stories. And so we didn't have people to learn from that, you know, like our peers or our whatever that had put out major records or even on a proper indie level. Um, and so we really just kind of had to figure it out as we went. And that was a, a role I enjoyed a lot was um, I was really heavily involved in the business of our band. I mean, I started the band, I named the band, I, solicited our demos and I networked our record deal and all that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But I loved it. I wouldn't have had it any other way. Um, 
but it was really like the the part that felt unique at the time was how much creative control we were able to have um and just control in general was important to us because it's like all right this is a, this is special to us and it's only going to be special if we can do it on our terms mm -hmm. try to you know fit us you know our, our square peg into a round hole it's it's not going to work you've got to let us do our thing with no one policing that and and that was what we were fortunate enough to be able to do. We signed with Warner Brothers in 2002, at the very beginning of 2002. And um, we were given 100% creative control from who did our album artwork to what songs went on our record to who produced our record and everything. And so it was really a special experience to be able to do everything on our terms coming from this place of like, I mean, we were all like deer in headlights. We just didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. Yeah. And I think it created a very pure intention and a very pure, um, I mean, it just came from ambition and passion really. And, and I loved it. Those are some of the best times of my life. You know, I, our first two records um, did, did pretty well. I mean, they both went platinum and, and it just, to get a deal and make a record at all was like a dream come true. I never would have expected it to have, the kind of fan base it's had and, and the kind of success it's had. And, and I'm so honored and humbled that it, that's been the case. And, and it still means so much to me and those fans still mean so much to me. So mm -hmm. really special. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, going from, you, you told a story about going from, you know, trying to, get a Green Day album at this store, that your local <laughs> store. And this is like, it's just so amazing to me, um, you know, trying to get money together to buy this Green Day album at this local record store. And then you end up in there, you know, signing records, like yeah. at a meet and greet for your yeah. album. It was so weird. I mean, yeah, to kind of retouch on that, it was just, again, uh, being this poor kid, I didn't have money. There was years of homelessness after I dropped out of high school and, and moved out of my parents' home. Um, but this was still while I was at home even. And I just remember they put out Insomniac and, and I didn't have the money for it, but I just rode with my friend over to the store. He went in and bought it, whatever albums, cause he had some money, but I just stood outside panhandling and yeah, it was a trip that like, you know, I, I was out there panhandling for quarters to buy a, a green day cassette tape. Mm -hmm. And then fast forward a few years at that same exact store and we were doing a signing for our second album. And it was literally like the line was like around the block. Like it was so long. We were there for so long. Um, and it was great. Like, and it, it was a trip too. Cause that store was literally like two blocks from the little tiny house I was renting when wow. I started the used and we were writing and recording those demos and stuff like that. And it's like, Hell, that line could have made it probably to that house. To your house, yeah. <laughs> that's no one incredible. had any idea that they were like right next to where this all started when we were finally not homeless and and had somewhere to rehearse and you know and it was one of those things where the contrast was just so crazy and so extreme. But I love it because it's just like I don't know. I I I've never want I've never want to shy away from sounding cheesy. I, I do it all the time. I don't mind because I love it. I think it's romantic to to really roll with some of this stuff. But it's just, you know, to sound cheesy, it just shows that doesn't matter where you're at in life, who you are, what what's going on, you can get out of it and your dreams can come true. Like I'll believe that till the day I die that um, you know, I, I know we all have major holdbacks and setbacks and and we're going to hit these roadblocks in our in our battle to accomplish those things but that doesn't mean they're not unachievable you know and we can do it there's nothing we can't do i i believe that with all my heart and i, I like to think i'm living proof because i would never in a million years believe that i am where i am today you know i just got off the phone with trey cool like 20 minutes before this interview you know? and it's like this is the guy I was panhandling for quarters to buy his album you know and now he's a good friend of mine and and like I don't know it's just I I truly believe we can do anything we just have to be willing to fight for it and and not ever give up you know
I love that. And and it and it really is a I don't know what the right word is, but it it shows who you are as a person, Brandon. And I have seen it um, personally just just through being friends with you. But you are the kind of person who doesn't ever take anything for granted ever, you know, and you live every single day to the fullest. And I love that about you. And I I think other people see that in you, too. And, you know, Trey and and everyone else, you have so many friends and oh, yeah. um, absolutely. And I did wanna talk about part of your life, which is really having fun and enjoying your time and taking opportunities to just play and play music and play with, you know, um, ATVs <laughs> and skateboard, <laughs> and, like yeah. literally do all the fun things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things like, I mean, life gives you everything you need. You get, you have all the examples and all the education you need right around you, you know? And to me, it was like, I look around and I see people that are miserable and what they're doing. I see people that are happy in what they're doing. And I just try to like learn from those things where it's like, you know, I, I my parents were great examples of what not to do in many, many ways. Um, and I've learned from so many people and, and the thing that gets me is like, I've lost too many people, you know, at growing up. I mean, starting at losing my father, not starting. I'd lost people before that, but that was the one that really hit me the hardest, you know, and then I've lost a lot of dear, dear friends and family along the way and haven't had a living grandparent since my early twenties. And, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. death was not a foreign thing to me, but I've learned, you know, I was, I grew up very conservative. Um, well, I wasn't, but in a very conservative house of, with like a Mormon upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, and there was just this kind of impending doom, like fear of death and all this stuff. And, and to me now, I'm just like, you know what? Like, it's such a waste of our time. Like I'm, I'm, I don't have like a, I'm agnostic. I don't, I'm a to each their own person. I, I don't mm -hmm. subscribe to Mormonism at all. Um, but I just, you know let respect everybody do their own thing, just be good to each other, you know? Absolutely. Um, but I, it did it did kind of shape something in a way where it's like, the one thing for sure is that our time is limited, you know? And I don't know how much time I have, I don't know how much time the people I love have. And I know that I lost a lot of years being really unhappy and really miserable. And I can never get those back, but I can make every day count. And so, it's like literally become like a, my like life goal to just try to have fun at all times. It's like, <laughs> what is the purpose of doing what I'm doing? If it's not, if the end goal isn't something I love or back or, you know, there are times it's like, we have to do things now and then, but right. it's greater good so that we can do the things we enjoy, you know? And, mm -hmm. and, um, I'd be lying to say I'm always just stoked on what I'm doing. I still battle depression. I still battle mental health issues. Like everybody, I'm human. But mm -hmm. where I can have some control and where how I'm spending my time, I want to do it doing something I love. And it, even if what I am doing is working on building a house and trying to drive a tractor or something, <laughs> that was still fun and I still loved it. But otherwise, it's like skateboarding was a massive massive major part of my life and always will be. So I still skate regularly and, and built my new house to like, I landscaped it. So the backyard is a skate park mm -hmm. and I've got like a half pipe and like all this stuff. Cause I was like, no, I like, that's important to me. I love that. And, and we live right next to sand dunes and this beautiful lake. And we take out like our side by side can ams and play in sand dunes all the time or go boating and wake surfing or, I mean, there's a million little hobbies I have that I just try to fill every day as much as I can. Yeah. With, you know, and it just is important. You got to be happy and you got to have fun. It's not a, not a superficial thing when materialistic thing where you need these like things to have that fun. It, it's just what you're doing. Go on a hike. I love hiking. I love the outdoors, you know, mm -hmm. the other day I was bummed because I don't like wind and it's <laughs> always windy where I live. So I literally was like, I need something that can bring me joy when it's windy. And I bought myself a $3 kite 
I went and flew a kite by myself because there I was go. Like the best of the fact it was windy and I hate wind. So I was like, I feel like I'm doing something fun. And this is what I was saying. Like th this, uh, that's the perfect example of exactly what I'm talking about. Like you're, I hate wind. I'm going to buy a kite and find a way to enjoy it. Yeah, you know? that was a great time. You know, and yes. now I just, yeah, I just grabbed that kite. <laughs> Kites are fun, right? A 43 year old punker that flies <laughs> kites. <whatever. laughs> I love it. I absolutely uh, love it. Um, yeah. So I, I do want to talk about a few years back. My goodness. It's got, got to be four years ago, maybe even, which is crazy to think about. But um, <laughs> we did a project together when I was at Zildjian. We did the the Passion Play um, mini documentary series. And it kind of like the idea was born out of a conversation that I had with you wow. about all of these hobbies that you had, these extreme sports and your passion and how, you know, music was part of it. But you had all of these other things that brought you so much joy. And so for the Passion Play series, we followed drummers in their everyday life doing what brought them passion. And I got a chance to um, go out to Utah with the film crew and have so much fun with you for a few days. It was an absolute blast. And I got an inside look into your life. And um, yeah, I mean, it was just, it was really incredible. And, and you actually guided me through learning to um, wakeboard, which was, <laughs> something I would have to practice much more often, but it was so much fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was just amazing to see you, your, your love for life, you know, and you talk about the depression and the, the suicidal thoughts. And then there's this other part of you that just finds this complete joy in all of these things. Um, one thing that you hadn't done at that point that, um, that you did later on was, um, swim with sharks. I remember oh. you and you and Danielle going and and it was in Hawaii, right? You were like right. in the deep ocean yeah, swimming with these sharks. <laughs> what was that? I got goosebumps when you brought it up again. I was like, ooh. Like, yes. That was honestly one of my favorite experiences I've ever had in my life. It was in, we were in Haliba, um, in, which is Oahu. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that's fascinated me for so long. But I'm terrified of water. I'm terrified of sharks because i'm a human and i think we all are right like yeah. but there's like this kind of um stigma with it that there are these like man eaters and that whatever you know and and so um i there's two key people that were such a huge part of me actually doing this was um this guy juan oliphant i hope i'm saying his last name right Mm -hmm. And his wife, Ocean Ramsey, they're both on um, social media and they are incredible people, incredible conservationists. And they, for a living, just swim with sharks and take out guided tours and do this conservation work that's incredible. Um, and I've been fascinated by their work and their imagery where they're not in cages. They're out in deep pelagic waters. So there's no plant life to be seen. It's just blue until... I mean, it's just blue everywhere you look. And so, yeah, Danielle and I were finally like, let's do this. Let's just try it, you know? And I reached out to them and, and got in touch with them. And we went out on, on a little dive with them for 90 minutes. We swam with 37 Galapagos and sandbar sharks. And it was like, I mean, of any like relaxing situation I've ever tried to put myself in, meditation, whatever it could be. I've never felt as relaxed as I did doing that. There was something about just this blue water, mm. 30 plus sharks surrounding us, the beauty of it, the, the, I mean, not to sound cheesy, but just being so one with nature and so humbled by it, you know, um, mm -hmm. was just a life changing experience and absolutely incredible. Um, and I cannot wait to go do much, much more of it. Like, it, we've literally had plans to go back so much and then I would be touring a lot or Danielle might be traveling for her work or whatever mm -hmm. it may be. And then with the pandemic and everything, we've just been so eager to get back. I want, I really want to swim with tiger sharks and great whites, which are out at this location all the time. Wow. Um, but just absolutely fascinating. And I still have a fear of water, you know, but I don't have a fear of sharks at all. Like I think they're incredible animals and, 
and you know, and, and I realize and have learned now how important they are mm -hmm. for our oceans and our planet. So um, it was a really special experience to be able to do all that for sure. That's, am that's sure. amazing. Absolutely. And I highly recommend it to anybody. It's, they're called one ocean diving. Um, and anybody that can get out to Hawaii, I highly, highly recommend it. That's fantastic. I've always wanted to, um, to do something like that. Like, you know, think about being in the cage, like, mm -hmm. you know, going down, but after seeing what you did and just being out in the open water, it was, it was amazing. I, I also encountered a, a shark in Hawaii while scuba diving, but yeah. wasn't, it wasn't like a, an ex, you know, an experience. I kind of like, well, it was heading in my direction and then it turned and went in the other direction, which I was happy for. <laughs> but, That's awesome though. But, um, but I agree with you. There's something about being like under the water and yeah, I love to scuba dive and just there, it's so quiet and peaceful and yeah. you kind of like realize where you are in the world. Exactly. Like your, your tiny place in the world. You know? <laughs> exactly. Um, and we're such like, as humans, I think we're so arrogant where we just think this is our world. And it's mm -hmm. like, it's not, it's yes. not. We're just one of many, many, many guests that need to do our part to protect it and to protect everything else. And, and you know, I mean, again, I, to me, originally I went into it just simply wanting to see sharks in real life. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't about conservation. It wasn't about any of this stuff, but this, the experience was so powerful and and just put everything into perspective like that, but it became all about that a hundred percent, but it was just, it was just interesting. And, and yeah, again, I highly recommend it. I think the more scared of sharks someone is, the more reason to go do it because it just makes you realize like, these are really, really beautiful animals that mm -hmm. we're not their food, you know, it's, right. it's not. And anybody that, doesn't believe that just do a tiny bit of research and, and you'll learn, <laughs> you know? Right. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. But I mean, speaking I mean, of, Oh, no, oh, no, 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 you go ahead. I was just going to say, speaking of sharks, um, I thought it was really fun and funny that you just recently watched jaws from your pool <laughs> in the water. And I have to say like, for some reason that scares, like I, I remember being a little kid and in the pool and, you know, I watched jaws at a young age um, and like swimming and thinking like, Oh, the sharks in the pool. There was that <laughs> one of the jaws movies. Didn't, didn't it like get into an area that it wasn't supposed to be in? Like, um, wasn't in the ocean, but was in like a, a tank like, or something. Yeah. In the jaws three. Cause we watched, we watched all three. It was funny, <laughs> but, but, but it's so ironic like, too, because they really are the reason why this stigma exists for sharks and it's really a ter they're terrible films in that way because they right. portray them in such a terrible way and that's where so many people have gotten our our fear of them mm -hmm. but they're entertaining now that i kind of have experienced the other side of it i can just watch it the same way i can watch you know sure. and not think that every clown's out to kill me or something right like that. <laughs> yeah. every clown is evil i i think i think it scared a lot of people from clowns for yeah yeah life, exactly. right but yeah that they but make think, a great. They make a great villain. You know what I mean? Yes. But it's fiction, like it's not to be forgotten that that's not real. Yeah. Know? Like. Right. Um, and it's like, well, yeah, and John Wayne Gacy too. So the, yeah, there are <laughs> cases where <laughs> clowns and that whole thing aren't so good, but yeah, doesn't mean they're all trying to kill us. So exactly. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, um, we we just turned on the pool lights like blood red. Mm -hmm. and, got this like pretty cheap projector thing and and <laughs> just popped it up on the side of the garage and it's incredible like it's like our new favorite thing now that's amazing and i just well. think for some reason like i'd be in the ocean and be less afraid than being in a pool and watching jaws <laughs> and feeling the water around me and it having it be in water with like <laughs> Under a raft with your little legs like dangling. Yes. And yeah, I would these scenes. No. It, certainly, it certainly was it added a, a new element of excitement to it for sure. But um, but you know what I was gonna say, like just a thought I've had talking about all this and all the it, it was ultimately something that I don't think I dove into when we did the passion play thing, but mm -hmm. was kind of like the realization I've had where there was so much. When I was in the used for so long, it was just kind of a, an identity thing. And I think 
my bands leading up to that, when I would introduce myself to people or whatever, it was almost like a from the became like my last name. I was Brandon mm -hmm. from the used or Brandon from rancid kind of thing. And it was like, I've always associated being in bands since I was 16, 17, started my first bands. It, it became so much part of my identity and mm -hmm. who I was in what I now think in a, a bad way, you know? And, and I remember, um, for people that don't know my whole story, when I was kicked out of the used in 2006, um, I was so heartbroken because I was kicked out of the band for being sober and not partying and, and they wanted someone that would party with them and, and all of that, mm -hmm. um, long story, but, um, it was heartbreaking and it really, it made me want to like quit the music industry for good. And it was just all this stuff. But one of the hard parts for me to work through was all of a sudden it felt like that identity was gone where mm -hmm. I was no longer Brandon from the used. I was just Brandon. And I was like, who gives a shit about Brandon Steinecker, you know, like, and it was a really weird thing because joining bands and, and creating those identities were so much of my coping to the harsh realities of my life at the time that to have that taken away from me while dealing with a new harsh reality of my life was a new obstacle I had to figure out how to overcome. And it was really hard on me, but, um, but I noticed that when I, when I joined Rancid and ever since then I've tried to make it a really like a point that I, I, what I do is I play drums for Rancid and I'm a part of Rancid, but it's not who I am. Mm -hmm. you know? and that's what kind of inspired me to branch out, especially since I have joined Rancid and, and our tour schedules might not be as crazy as they were when I was in the used. Um, so I have this free time and it just kind of created this little bit of a void where it was like, or maybe not a void, but just this time mm -hmm. that I could, I could fill doing other things I enjoyed. And those things also aren't who I am. They're the things I enjoy. And when you start doing what you love for a living, I think it's important to continue to have hobbies. And that helps keep the perspective of drums are my hobby and what I love, not what I do for work, you know? Um, and so it just kind of created this new thing where all of these fun hobbies, all these activities and all this stuff were a kind of a way of just filling the gaps and, and truly living life and not feeling like I'm tied to one thing and I'm required to do one thing only. And that's all that there is to me. It was just like, like there needed to be more to my life and more to me. And there always was, I just wasn't giving it enough room to breathe, you know? And so that was, that's been a, a big part of it for me, you know? I really, really understand exactly what you're saying. And I, I think there's something empowering about figuring out who you are yourself, apart yeah. from where you work, who you work with, what you do, you are good enough. Brandon Steinecker, you know, right. you, know you right. And, and you have so many facets to you as a person, as a human being, and um, your, re your place in the world in relation to those around you and to what you spend your time doing. I think it's incredibly important to come to that realization, um, you know, and not, and not be tied to a, a title at the end of your name. Right. Um, and, right. I, and I think that is another thing that this time period through the pandemic has made very apparent to a lot of people because their identities have changed or been, you know, put in jeopardy as far as, you know, what they spend their time doing in this industry. It's been yeah. a, it's been a tough thing for so many of the people that, you know, we call friends and that we love and for us in particular. And it's, it's a, yeah, it's been a changing time period for sure. Yeah. And, it, and it, it's important where I don't think it just applies to people that play in bands. I think it applies mm -hmm. to anyone that, anybody with your day job, how you spend your days. If you're a, a stay at home parent, if you're whatever it is you do, you know, I think it's just, it was more of that kind of eye opening. Like that doesn't define me. That doesn't, mm -hmm. that isn't who I am. And I need to allow myself to be more than just that thing that takes a lot of my time mm -hmm. or that thing. That's a major passion of mine and what I love to do. But it's like, you know, I, I, I went into my career knowing that it, it was, 
I was incredibly fortunate to have that, to be able to do that. Um, and to be able to quit my job at Burlington Coat Factory, yeah. tagging women's shoes, you know? And the last day I punched out of that job because I was leaving on tour with my band, The Used, and it was like, I was putting out this record. It was just kind of like, yeah, like, but that's not who I am. There's more mm -hmm. to me than that. And I always want there to be more to me than that. And I think all of us, as, as much as our actions define us, you know, that's in our behaviors, how we treat people, how we, you know, um, I believe that, but I don't think how we spend our time should define us and be all that we credit ourselves to be. You know, I right. think we're a lot more than that, you know, whatever, stay home parent. There's a lot more depth to everybody, you know, and we just need to, I don't know, allow it to breathe, you know? Be yeah. That, be that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and I, you know, I love the way that, um, you know, you, you touched on it a bit, but, you know, you kind of like come into your own identity and live in that and let other people live their identity as well. And, you know, we've had so many conversations about, um, you know, respecting people and their wishes and, but being our own person and also like getting that respect too. Right. And so, you know, I always appreciated that about you. Um, just, being so accepting of people and who they are and, and everything about them. Oh, thank you. I, I, I think it was important to me early on where as a teenager kind of trying to figure out, you know, it felt like titles needed to define you. It was just kind of coming from a very narrow way of thinking. Um, and again, crediting my, my childhood and the way I was raised as a, as a, in a conservative Mormon family, that, you know, as a part of this religion that tended, you know, the community around it tended to be very self-righteous and judgmental. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did not like that. I did not agree with most things in, in that way. Um, and then I, it was like, I remember being a teenager and, and I've always been drug free and sober my whole life. And I remember right at first, like hearing about straight edge and learning about straight edge and being like, Hey, that's like me. I'm straight edge, you know, mm -hmm. it was like a, a month maybe that like, I would like refer to myself as straight edge. And, and then I realized I was like, I don't need a title on that. Mm -hmm. Like, that's fine if other people do, but that's not why I don't do this stuff. I had friends like dropping acid when we were 12 years old and, and it was just a little like, I don't know. I, I got exposure to it early on and just knew it was something that I wasn't interested in. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just, it, it kind of, I feel like that one thing set the, the pace for a lot of what happened in life where there would be these stereotypes that would exist and these assumptions made where it's like, oh, I look this certain way. Like I've got green hair and a nose ring. I must be like this party or fuck up kid. And it's like, no, like, and it's like, oh, but you're from Utah and you're a Mormon, you're raised Mormon. So you're this like, no, I'm not that either. And mm -hmm. it was just like. I kind of loved not filling stereotypes and knowing that people, you know, as my career started, I, I would do press and stuff. And it was like the dumbest questions and like, Oh, so you're all polygamists. You're all from Utah. You're all Mormon. It's like, really? Come on. You really think like, you know, and, and, and then the same thing as I remained sober and drug free my whole life through my career, it was like people would assume it was this like hard stance against anti-drugs. And it's like, no, it was my best friends or addicts or recovered alcoholics or currently or whatever. And it's like, it just kind of life just taught me that it was like, you can't assume anything. Mm -hmm. There are people that are good people that just might, you might assume a lot based on a couple things you know about them or the way they look, the way they, whatever. And it was just kind of nice lessons learned that are very basic elementary style lessons that mm -hmm. you should all know. But that's where to me, like, race, gender, sex, all this stuff, class. Why should any of that matter? One of my best friends to this day is a pizza delivery guy, you know? And it's like, I love that guy. I would take a bullet for him. And he's a better person than a lot of like famous people I know. And so it's like, if there's someone I was going to stand in line to meet, it would be him, you know? And so mm -hmm. it just goes to show none of this stuff matters. Like, and, and, and gender, sex, all these things, like, 
that's why I like I'm a, I'm a huge ally for the LGBTQ community. I, and I just think in the end, if we're treating each other with love and kindness, nothing else matters, you know, flip us all inside out. We're all exactly the same. And so nothing else matters. And I think it's a shame that we live in a world that that isn't just common sense, but right. all we can do is our part, you know, lead by example. And you do a great job of that. And, you know, so appreciative, um, you know, of you and, and just the way that you live your life and the example that you set for others. So thank you. You're, absolutely. <laughs> um, and before we go, I just want to hear, you know, what are you up to into the future? What are your future plans even, you know, into next year? Normally I would have great answers for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like hyping up this and this and this. These days I feel like to plan anything is yes. a joke, you know? So all I can say is that there will be concerts, there will be new albums, there will be, you know, so mm -hmm. there. I've recorded new music um, with Rancid. We've, we've got tour plans. Um, I feel like announcing anything is jumping the gun. Sure. I <laughs> agree. Yes. As, as excited as I am that we feel like we're on the back end of this mess um, until it feels like that door is shut behind us and like, and things are properly announced through the proper channels. Mm -hmm. I don't quite dare get my hopes up yet. Yeah. But, let's um, just cross our fingers and, you know, we'll, we'll wait for the good news to come, but exactly. we'll, expect, we'll expect fun things coming Exactly. Up. But we, we do have, we have announced we're playing a festival in Sacramento with Metallica and tons of great bands. Um, we're playing Riot Fest in Chicago with so many great bands. So those are announced and that's happening as long as everything continues the way it's going. So I'm absolutely thrilled because I, for my mental health, I need to get on stage and behind my drums with my bandmates, you know, but. Um, I understand yeah. that. I I'm, can't wait to see you back out there. Oh, thank you so much. Me too. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you so much, Brandon. It's been so awesome to catch up with you. Oh, and thank you for having me. You're such a great friend and I'm honored to be a part of this. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. And we will see each other again soon. For sure. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for tuning in today. Join us each Tuesday for new episodes of Sarah Hagen Backstage.